Okay, uh, wait. So just for posterity's sake. Super, thank you. Wow, we're getting people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Very nice. It's the advantage of a pandemic. Yeah. The silver lining. So I'd say it's about time to start. Um, so welcome everyone to the X-Prague Wine series. Um, we ask you to turn on your videos because we really want to see you and we'll keep the uh, mic switched off um, for the time of the talk. Uh, we'll turn it on later on. And um, so the idea of this series is that we'll gather once a month, um, hear an exciting talk, and most importantly, we will drink wine together. And uh, so, um, so we are really delighted um, that our first speaker today of this series is Nausicaa Pusculus, whose work I admire a lot. And um, Nausicaa will give us a 30 minute talk and then we'll have 30 minutes for discussion. And we ask you to please type your questions into the chat box and then we'll call you on to ask your question personally later on. And so before I hand it to Ira to introduce Nausicaa, um, let me just say a few words about the idea behind this series. So the idea came to me uh, when I watched a Zoom talk with my friend Camilo and we had a glass of wine together and I realized that um, a Zoom event can actually be very entertaining. And it's also been like way too long that we've all uh, seen each other in person. So in the past we had the um, biannual EXPRA conferences, conference uh, every two years. And so now um, this pandemic is actually an opportunity for us to meet on a more regular basis in an informal forma, uh, format. Um, and so this is also um, a way for us um, to have people here uh, from across the world. And um, finally, we can use this also as a forum where we try out new talk formats. And so when I talked to Ira about this idea, um, he said to me, oh, this really reminds me of the wine and cheese series that we used to have when I was at NYU. And so for each talk, we could make a suggestion for a specific kind of wine that we drink together, and this will get us through the pandemic. And so um, I'll hand it over to Ira now to say a few words. Okay, well, well, thanks for that. Um, I, you know, when Nicole uh, presented the idea to me, I mean, I was flattered that she asked me uh, about this and I was enthusiastic, I thought it was a great idea. Um, and uh, so this is her brainchild, um, and I'm happy to uh, you know, do my part. Uh, I'm also going to be introducing Nausicaa. Um, so let me turn to that. Uh, Nausicaa, um, I mean, actually, you know, I was hoping that we could kind of be informal. The idea of having wine was that this shouldn't seem too formal with the, uh, um, you know, uh, oh, come on, Ira, you can introduce me informally of all people, really. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, uh, that's what I was thinking, that you are, I ought to be able to introduce you informally, but I know I have to kind of put on my academic hat here and just introduce you as I would any special guest. Um, so let me do that, Nozika, okay? <laughs> uh, so Nozika got her degree, uh, got degrees in philosophy, also in Greek uh, language. 
Um, and then she went on to do a master's in cognitive science. What I most appreciate about Nazika is that she was the first PhD student to take a chance on me. And she was ultimately, uh, I mean, she was actually jointly supervised with Dan Sperber and myself. Um, <clears throat> after she did a spectacular job as a PhD student, she went to do a postdoc at, at Leipzig's Max Planck, where she worked with Elena Levin and um, Michael Tomasello. And actually, I wanted to check this with you, Nazika, but, uh, but I, I would say that you were the first sort of properly trained experimental pragmatist as far as I know, to get like a newly minted job that was advertised as such. Oh yeah, I think uh, I got the first ever experimental pragmatic job, yeah. Yeah, cool. <laughs> uh, and at UCL, where she is, at University College of London, uh, I, I learned actually through Twitter uh, that she regularly wins nominations for her teaching skills. Uh, oh, I, I... For things, things like inspiring teaching delivery, Excellent personal tutoring and um, uh, uh, giving feedback. Is that right? Uh, and um, but that's all. You know, that's all the sort of technical stuff. I mean, as far as working with Anasika, um, you know, what you learn quickly is that she's a great integrator of ideas. She's a great team player, and she's just like a very thoughtful uh, person. Uh, and, you know, just like, and I just want people to know too, that it wasn't my, I mean, I would have invited Nausicaa, but it was Nicole's idea that Nausicaa should be our first guest. So there's no kind of favoritism here. When, when I asked her uh, what made her think of Nausicaa, she wrote to me, and I fully agree with what she said. She said, well, she's contributed to the core areas of experimental pragmatics, acquisition of implicature, metaphor, she worked on embedded implicatures. And then, and then she said, and I'm quoting that she likes how she's open-minded. Uh, and I think what she means is that she's like theoretically oriented. And then she wrote, you know, she's not married to theory so that, so that experiments end up providing solid and unbiased uh, evidence. So um, given that she speaks to a, a wide range of communities, uh, well, here I'm quoting again from Nicole, um, and let me add, um, you know, she's just kind of like the definition of uh, experimental pragmatics. So I'll turn it over to you, Nausicaa. Well, I, I, I think now I can only blush and, and, and run away. I mean, I was incredibly humbled uh, to be invited to be the first speaker. I think the idea uh, is absolutely fantastic. And just seeing uh, so many people here from uh, everywhere is, um, well, just a, a tiny bit scary. But thank you very, very much, Ira and Nico, for having me. And thank you especially for, for uh, well, for, uh, for inventing this new venue. Uh, so today I yes, decided- to say cheers to Nausicaa. Uh, cheers, cheers. Well, I'm in scene, I'm a tea toddler today. Um, so I, I decided to talk about false implicatures because uh, which is um, a, a dangerous choice, especially with so many of you uh, that I admire um, online, because uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on, on some projects um, with false implicators, but the idea behind was that it's fairly new and um, it's one of the next best big things. So I think we should think about them. Um, okay. Ah, yeah. Okay. So I can't see exactly all my, my screen, but I hope it will be okay. Uh, please, during the talk, uh, if you have questions or whatever, react. It's nice. It's nice to see your faces. It's nice to hear questions if you have uh, clarification questions. Please, please, please don't be like my students who, are, who don't react. <laughs> um, so, um, so pragmatically infer meaning can be false. If I say I've eaten some of the cookies, meaning I haven't eaten all, well, it might uh, turn out to be false and that might be even intentional. Um, so an implicator or an enrichment can be used to deceive, it can be misleading. And interestingly, it doesn't seem to have quite the same status as a lie. I mean, this has been looked at and it's, it's not very clear entirely whether we see these as lies or not, but not, not, it seems not quite 
quite at any rate. And of course, speakers can exploit this. Um, so the idea now is to look at two studies uh, about how hearers react to false implicators or pos possibly false implicators. And well, because it's Christmas and it's bedtime, uh, at least for my kids, we're also going to have lots of stories. Um, so the first study is on implicators and cooperation. And um, it's a study that comes from Giulio Ducinati's uh, PhD. And thankfully, Giulio is here. So, so he, can, um, he can correct me if I say something wildly wrong. Um, so let's look at cooperation. Cooperation, we know from Grice, is key to pragmatic inferences. According to Grice, we can't really have pragmatic inferences without cooperation. And so it stands to reason that speakers should infer, infer more implicators in a situation where interlocutors are cooperative than in one where they're not. So if, if we're in a situation where the speaker is uncooperative, uh, but he's not opting out, so he's not clearly uh, opting out of the... Uh, then, according to Grice, the speaker, sh the hearer, sorry, uh, should not derive the implicators at all. But if we look at uh, relevance theory or, or, or tenets of epistemic vigilance, then uh, the speaker should infer the implicator, but might choose to reject it. So that's that's what we look at. Um, so what happens in a cooperative situation with an implicator? Uh, so uh, if the speaker is in cooperative, maybe, um, sorry. That, that seems to be fairly the, the same. Uh, so either the speaker doesn't derive the implicator at all, or the speaker derives it but rejects the content of the implicator. And the idea behind this is that um, the derivation of an implicator and the believability or the epistemic assessment of the content of the pragmatic inference are two independent processes. And sorry, I'll go back just a sec. This was already shown to be the case for implicators uh, and politeness. So, <clears throat> so the question here uh, is, do speakers derive implicators in uncooperative processes? Do they derive implicators when the implicators might be deceitful? So what we looked at were cooperative versus uncooperative contexts. And we were trying to distinguish be between the possibility that implicators are not inferred at all, but and the possibility when an implicator is in inferred but rejected. So for this, we had a question about the implicator, some but not all, and a separate um, a separate epistemic judgment, and then as well a question about whether the speaker intended to communicate the implicature. And this was a questionnaire on prolific academic with lots and lots of participants. Uh, so what was, I think that says prediction at the top, I assume. So according to a Gricean account, what uh, the hearer should derive the implicators from the, the, the should not derive the implicators from uncooperative speakers. Whereas, according to relevance theory, the speakers should derive all the pragmatic inferences to arrive to an optimally relevant interpretation. But then the speaker might, the hero, sorry, might reject the content of the uh, of um, of the utterance if it's the speaker is de deemed untrustworthy. Okay. So here are, here are the kind of scenarios we had. So these are my stories, right? So uh, uh, rather, this is, these are two Julius very nice stories. You have a non, non cooperative version where uh, imagine that you are about to sit a competitive exam for a particular position in your company. The exam has multiple choice and open answer questions. You don't remember whether you need to answer all the open answer questions in order to pass. You ask the person who has just sat the exam before you what she knows about the open questions. There is only one position opening and it's very well paid. Therefore, you know that she probably hopes that you fail the exam so that she has a better chance of getting the job. 
And in the cooperative version, there's again an exam, uh, but it's an exam for a particular qualification in the company. The middle paragraph is the same, but the end changes again. The company has promised bonuses to all the employees if enough people pass the exam. Therefore, she probably hopes that you both pass the exam, okay? So after this, the, uh, um, there's the target sentence. She says some of the open answer must be, must be answered. And then you have these three questions that appear separately. Given what she told you, do you think it's possible that all the open questions must be answered? That's the epistemic question. The meaning question is, do you think she meant that you don't need to answer all the open questions? So that's a meaning question. And the deception question is, do you think she was trying to mislead you? And here we have the results that are um, quite clear. You can see the cooperative, you can see, I can't, but <laughs> you can see the, the cooperative uh, and non-cooperative context. And in the epistemic uh, question, is it possible that all is the case? You see a clear difference, uh, which is statistically significant. And this shows that the manipulation works, right? So the, the two, the two conditions work. What's quite interesting, but of course, this doesn't tell us anything about whether the implicature was, uh, was derived and not, uh, and not, uh, and the content ac not accepted, or whether the implicature wasn't derived at all. What's much more interesting is this pattern of responses taken together with the meaning, the pattern of the meaning question, where you see that both in the cooperative and non-cooperative conditions, the, the, the participants do, um, uh, understand the, that the character meant not all. So this, this shows that they seem to have derived the implicator in both cases and suggests that um, if they answered, um, uh, um, differently in the epistemic question, this is because they derived the implicature but chose not to accept the content. And the fact that we also have a difference in the deception question, was the character trying to mislead, also suggests the same thing. So, uh, so it seems that the pattern of response is in goes against Grice and in support of a relevant theory, epistemic vigilance account that highlights a dissociation between the processes of comprehension of the pragmatic inferences and its acceptance. Okay, so that, that was it for the, 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 the first experiment and I'll move on to the second one. I hope I'm not doing too slowly for time. So here is a second experiment again around false implicators, but with very, very different questions. And this was uh, um, work done uh, with Francesca Bonalumi, Yo Yo Johannes Ma, and Pauline Marie, who uh, didn't send me a picture. And so I found one of, um, uh, well, I suppose um, her great, great, great grandmother. Well, in the end, at the very last minute, she did send me a picture, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put the, the real. So, so Pauline was actually uh, the one who ran uh, the experiment. Um, so, so this, this, in this experiment, we looked at commitment. And so utterances in general commit the speaker to a proposition or a future course of action, for instance, in a promise. Now, of course, this only works if the audience has a mechanism to track the commitment of the speaker and to hold them accountable to it. But how a speaker expresses a message might have an impact on how committed they appear to be, how accountable uh, um, the, the hero will hold them. And I, I, I really have an issue today with hero and speaker. I'm sorry, I mean, it seems all the slides reverse the two. Um, and it also has an impact on the reputational cost for false information or, or, or false promise. Okay. Now, what's interesting is that uh, it might be easier to be less committed to implicit meaning, and implicit meaning can also be more easily plausibly denied. 
So the speaker can deny more easily, well, can deny having intended an implicature, for instance. That can help the, the speaker avoid reputational cost uh, if the implicator turns out to be false or if a promise is not fulfilled. And so it might be interesting to, um, to use this if you're a strategic speaker. For instance, uh, Pinker and colleagues give the example of bribes where you, you're going to have a ticket and you tell the officer, well, maybe we can take care of the ticket here. And this is because you can deny the implicator of deny the, the implicator of wanting to bribe them if the the, the officer is not uh, amenable to it, uh, and at the same time it might gain something if the if the officer actually is happy to take the bribe. Now, what's interesting is that we all know that pragmatic phenomena, all of them, enrichments and implicators, are by definition cancelable. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they are necessarily, necessarily plausibly deniable. So being cancelable means that I can, without contradiction, negate uh, the pragmatic inference. That doesn't necessarily mean that I can plausibly deny having intended to communicate it, right? So we wanted to look at commitment at factors that might have, um, have an impact on commitment and plausible deniability. Um, and one uh, factor that might play a role and seems to play a role is um, the type uh, of meaning and uh, how explicitly you express something. Um, so it seems that there are less reputational costs for false implicatures. So um, Diana Mazzarella and uh, colleagues uh, showed that when a false information is com communicated through an assertion or presupposition, the speaker tends to, to, to be more, while well, the hearers want, would be more ready to punish the speaker and would trust them less. Whereas when a false information is communicated by an implicature, the, the hero is, well, the participants are less prone to punish the speaker and would still be happy to trust them. And a similar pattern is observed by Francesca Bonalumi and colleagues and with promises. So when you have an unfulfilled promise, if it has been conveyed by an enrichment, then the promise is considered to be broken and, and, and the participants see that it requires an, an apology. But if an unfulfilled promise has been conveyed via an implicature, then they don't see it as having been broken to the same extent or uh, as needing an apology. Now, another factor that might modulate accountability and plausible deniability of a message is how strongly an implicit meaning is communicated. Uh, so a very strongly communicating implicature may even be viewed as part of what is said. So it may even be uh, 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 perceived by the by the by hearers by participants as explicit meaning. If that's the case, then it seems that it would be much more difficult to deny. So whether an implicator uh, is strongly or weakly communicate should also uh, make a difference on um, both how committed the speaker seems to be and uh, how plausibly deniable the implicature is. Okay, so this is more or less what we have. We have, we have one dimension, which is how explicit uh, um, the content. Uh, the so, sorry, how explicit the the the, the, the how explicitly um, something is communicated. So it can be a fully encoded content, it can be an enrichment or generalized conversational implicator, or it can be a particularized implicator. So from the most 
in explicit to the most implicit. And then you have another dimension, which is whether, you know, how weakly or strongly a content is communicated. So we have these two factors, the level of meaning, the, uh, whether it's an enrichment or an implicature, um, and um, that uh, the idea behind this level of meaning is that something that's an enrichment is closer to the explicit content. Uh, and um, so, so the, the speaker sh should be more committed to something or appear to be more committed to something that's conveyed by an enrichment and, um, and the reverse uh, for an implicature. And then you have meaning strength. Again, something that's strongly communicated should be something that the speaker appears to be more committed to uh, and should be less easily uh, uh, deniable than something that's weakly communicated. So how are we going to look at accountability. So we took two measures for accountability as, as a proxy for accountability. One was blame and one was trust. So how blameworthy the speaker is perceived to be and how much the hearer was ready to trust that speaker. And then we also wanted to look at plausible deniability. And as a measure for plausible deniability, what we did is that we introduced one condition where the implicit content, whether the enrichment or implicature was denied and took the same two accountability measures and one where there was no deni denying at all. Okay. And that was again, uh, um, a, a question on prolific. Um, and before, before the, what I'm going to show you now, we had a first experiment where we looked at the implicatures and enrichments we used uh, to, to make sure that the participants derived them. Um, okay. So that, that I suppose says, uh, uh, um, hypothesis. So, uh, I call, so the, uh, so what we predicted was that for the implicative strength, the um, you should have higher accountability for strong than than for weakly uh, communicated uh, implicatures, and it should be harder to deny a strongly communicated implicature than a weakly communicated implicature. And for the level of meaning, uh, there should be a higher accountability for enrichment, which are closer to the uh, explicit meaning than for an implicature. And that should be the case with or without denial. And it should be easier to deny um, an implicature than an enrichment. Again, because the enrichment is closer to the, uh, to the uh, explicit meaning. Okay, so here is the design and we'll go through it because there's, there's a lot. So we had two, two so for the so materials, we had two types of uh, inferences. We had particularized implicatures on the one hand and enrichments. So these were scalar implicatures with some, uh, the conjunction and, or, and if. Um, and then we had, in both cases, strong or weak implicatures and strong and weak enrichments in all the cases. And then, uh, to look at plausible deniability, we had one condition with denial and one condition without denial. And then for everything, we had two measures. One was blame and trust. And now I'm going to show you what it looks like with a story because it will be so much easier. So in the weak condition, for instance, you have something like Sophie and Elliot are colleagues and both work in a bar as band tenders. There is no more craft beyond tap and Sophie and Elliot have to change the keg. It is Tuesday night and there are very few customers. You see that I chose exactly the right story for today. Uh, in the strong condition, uh, Sophie and Elliot are again, um, bartenders uh, and they again have to change the keg, keg but this time it's Saturday night and there's a lot of impatient customers. So what's going to follow is going to be much more relevant. So Sophie says there's no more craft beer on tap and then Elliot says I'll finish making the cocktail and change the keg. Okay so what happens to the keg is uh, much more relevant in the strong condition than in the weak condition. Okay, so then uh, you can see, we see the story 
I, do, I just read with the two, the, these two conditions. And then you have a set where Elliot leaves the cocktail he was making and goes to change the keg. The customer whose cocktail it was complains to Sophie and Sophie is unhappy about this. So, so we see that um, the order of events is the opposite of uh, uh, what was um, promised in a, in, in a sense. And then in gray, you have the denial, which appears for half the participants, but not for the other half. You said you would finish making the cocktail before changing the keg. And Elliot says, I didn't say that I would do that first. I, I said I'd finish making the cocktail and change the cake. And then for everybody, you would have a comprehension question. And then you had a blame question. If you were Sophie, how much would you blame Elliot for misleading you? Um, and a mistrust question. If you were Sophie, how much would you mistrust Elliot in the future? Okay. Right. Okay. And I'm going to skip on this slide with um, the, the findings of um, the linear max, mixed model, because I think it's far too late for that. And plus you've drank some wine, so it's we are going to go directly to the conclusions. So what's very interesting is that we, th we found that implicative strength modulates both accountability and plausible deniability. In fact, that was the, the, the biggest finding of the study. So there was a main effect on strength, stronger implicatures result in more accountability than weak implicatures. Um, and you have higher accountability uh, for strong implicatures after denial uh, and weakly implied commitments uh, are, are, can be plausibly denied. Now, that pushes forwards heavily uh, the importance of implicative strength for plausible deniability. And what is very interesting is that Diana Mazzarella had actually completely independently come, come up with a theory um, uh, well, basically, she predicted exactly that on, on, on theoretical grounds, and she presented this a couple of years ago um, in Croatia, uh, I believe. So, um, so it, it fits very well together. Now, when it comes to uh, impl uh, the difference uh, for meaning, uh, for, for the type of meaning and the, le the degree of in explicitness, we find what, what we thought we would find that is a difference between implicature and enrichment. And that fits very well with previous, um, with previous research. And it also fits with, I think, findings of Alison Hall and Diana Mazzarella, who also, I think, looked at uh, uh, the difference between implicator and enrichment in, I think, a yet unpublished paper. So the level of meaning modulates plausible deniability. Uh, uh, so an implicator can, is more pl plausibly deniable. You have uh, blame rates that are lower after denial. So it's more plausibly deniable than an enrichment where you have, where, with or without denial, the, the rates are uninfected. Uh, but meaning, uh, um, so the, the level of meaning, sorry, again, there's a typo, uh, um, doesn't have uh, an effect um, on accountability in the absence of denial. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you to all these lovely people who basically did all the work that I presented uh, today. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole and Ira, for inviting me. And thanks all of you for uh, being here and uh, being part of this amazing community, which is Experimental Pragmatics. I'm really sorry for the ones who aren't here. I have to say, some of you are very difficult to track online. and um, and well, for the others, um, there's a point where my husband just told me to stop procrastinating and get on with actually doing the slides for the talk. Thank you, Nausicaa. So um, you can type your questions um, into the chat as we announced, um, and then we'll call you on. So, um, um, so, so 
do you want me to keep that on or do you want me to uh i can't see the chat right i guess if you're on that mode you can see the chat yeah so perhaps then stop sharing the screen and then we can um yeah, yeah, I, I like the way you say this, as if I knew how. Come on, I managed to share the screen. <laughs> it was already a big <laughs> achievement. Uh, okay, stop sharing the screen. There must be a way, right? Ah, there's yeah. A, there's yeah, a question yeah, from, yeah, 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 uh, I, got, I got it. Okay, now, now it's all good. From uh, Napoleon. Um, and I'll unmute you, Napoleon, if you'd like to ask your question. Hey, happy Christmas, everybody. Um, fantastic talk, thank you, and great idea. Um, really great idea to have this talk. Um, Nausicaa and uh, Julio um, and everyone else who contributed to this, I think fascinating questions, great results. M my question about the first study was whether we're actually dealing a case of a speaker who doesn't cooperate in some sense or whether it's a case of a speaker who actually pretends to cooperate. So it is, there is that element of uh, pretense from the person who answers, you know, you need to do some of the tasks. Um, and it's at that level that the participants in the experiment report that the implicature was derived um, because there is cooperation, except it's, it's pretend cooperation. So if she was pretending to cooperate, she was pretending to mean some, but not all. I'm not sure if I'm coming across, if I'm explaining what I mean, but let me know guys. But thank you anyway, fantastic. Um, Julia, did you want to answer this? No? If you want to, hold on, I could unmute him. Hi, great talk. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I think that it can be construed as a case of uh, pretense cooperation. Is if we can imagine that both uh, interlocutors can imagine that there is can understand that there is no cooperation in the setting. Um, so I think the overall situation is one of non cooperation. But whether I think you're where you're going with this is whether under pretense of cooperation, Grice would allow uh, implicature. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, my take on this is that, uh, I, actually, I think that we've discussed this before, right? Um, yes, I think he, under that circumstance, Grice would probably allow um, implicature, at least under some interpretation of Grice, uh, not under the logic and meaning interpretation. So in, in later writings, yes, I think it would, but in the early writings, no. Remember you agreeing with this at, at the time. <laughs> so um, Mira, you, would you like to ask a question? You put something in the chat. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, I would just like to draw people's attention that many of these are the ideas were part of a PhD thesis of a student of mine in Rachel Diora, Marit Sternau, levels of meaning. Uh, we didn't test it this way, we tested it a different way, but very similar results and quite earlier, I would say. So the difference between explicated inferences and strong implicatures and weak implicatures and linguistic meaning. And we, we definitely <laughs> distinguished between cancelability, which is of course anything pragmatic, and deniability, that is the ease with which uh, subjects would accept that the speaker indeed could reasonably deny uh, what she said. So I'm very happy with your results, but uh, I would like to send you uh, references to papers by my students so that you can properly, properly acknowledge that she started this earlier. Uh, thank you very much. I think we actually, in the written version, we, we, do, we do have uh, some references to her work, but we might not have all of it, so it would be great uh, okay. if you send it to us. All right. 
Thank you very much. Great work. <laughs> And next up, uh, there's a question from Larry. Hi, uh, thanks, Nasika. That was really enjoyable. I've been looking a lot at um, the interface between language and law, and in particular, uh, the circumstances under which false implicatures can not only count as lies, but uh, instances of perjury and the circumstances under which they can. So it's, this is very relevant research for those issues. I was wondering though, whether for instance, in the last study, uh, when you talk about the uh, asymmetric uh, strengthening of uh, conjunction uh, where you build in temporal uh, asymmetry, uh, whether we know in advance uh, if we're dealing with that as an instance of implicature following uh, Grice's own work and Levinson and more recently in uh, the uh, paper by Weissman and Turkarafi that you mentioned, that was one of their examples of implicature that uh, do seem to work differently from the cases of, of lies. Uh, on the other hand, in, uh, relevance, in the relevance theoretic tradition, uh, in a number of places, Karsten sometimes uh, jointly with Blakemore uh, has treated um, conjunction buttressing as an instance of uh, enrichment. So, you know, without knowing in advance, without having uh, uh, independent evidence for determining whether a particular instance of pragmatic uh, uh, strengthening or pra pragmatic reasoning is an instance of implicature or enrichment, uh, I'm not sure how we, what, what kinds of predictions we would make and what inferences we would draw from the results that you get. Uh, well, we assumed that um, we we put and in the in the in the enrichment category, which seems to fit with uh, the finding the experimental findings uh, that that show that some phenomena, whether they're they're, they're enrichments or seen as uh, generalized um, implicatures tend to, to, we react to them in a close fashion uh, to explicit uh, meaning. Uh, and that, that was our thinking there. So basically that was, an, uh, that was our decision. Um, so both for and uh, or some um, and if. Um, and for and at least, as far as I know, uh, uh, it's been tested often enough, and it always seems to go more uh, towards explicit meaning than particularized implicatures. So that doesn't necessarily uh, mean anything at the theoretical level, but that would be enough, I yeah. think, for what we're looking at here. I see, because in the, the Weissman and Turkarafi, it's somewhere in the middle of their results in terms of how many of their respondents classified false uh, yeah but I mean if I'm if I remember if I remember well they had a, a an, an unusual pattern where uh, which I mean which works well of course for 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 lies but where it was it was cardinals and and right. one other category only. Right, the, the double the doublings the you know there are boxes and boxes where there were only two boxes that was the other one but in those cases I think there's a strong argument that we're not dealing with implicatures or enrichment we are yeah. real dealing with what is said and yeah exactly, a exactly. That a lot of people have taken independently so yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the interesting cases involving the scalar examples for instance um, where you have the adjective scalars and then you have the quantifiers like some and all and or and and. And those seem to be, uh, respondents seem to be more uh, inclined to view those as separate from, from lies to, to, uh, to some extent. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think the, the conjunction cases are in that group rather than in the group with the cardinals. Yeah, so, so the idea, so I think in a sense, we, we were looking at that group, which, which we called, so, so, or things that would fall within that group, which were, we classified as enrichments. And then the party, the, what we called implicatures were very, very clear particularized implicatures where I don't think anyone would have any 
um, you know, any any dispute about the fact that it, okay, their clear case is completely dependent on the context. Like the Gricean um, letter of recommendation or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that that kind of that kind of things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So that that was the, that was the opposition there, and I don't think this. Uh, I mean, of course, I I come from a theoretical background where where I would consider them enrichments, but I don't think that has any influence here. I don't. I think there's still a distinction to be made, wh whatever your theoretical background. Okay. Uh, thanks for that, Larry. Next question is from thanks. Mikel. Yeah. Hi, Nausicaa. Hi, everyone. That that was really nice. Uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I was just wondering whether I got your last slide correctly. That you say that that the levels of meaning didn't really affect accountability, right? Is that correct? Because um, there, there was a lot of information. So if I got you correctly, we, weaker uh, in Pikachu are easy, well, weaker versions are easier to deny. But but accountability, it, it was the very last slide, I think. Yeah, 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 Mihail, I can count on you to just to make my life difficult, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that. So there okay. is no influence of meaning strength of on accountability, right? In the absence of yeah, denial. So, so, right. so, so my question is, yeah, so if this is correct, what does it tell? How do you square this with, I'm wondering, with all the epistemic vigilance story, um, what, what does it tell? Basically, uh, why, why, why accountability doesn't parallel? denial and the rest of your results? Uh, I mean, that's that's a very good question. And I'm wondering whether it's um, it's not that, uh, in a sense, it, was a, it wasn't strong enough because you clearly see it with plausible deniability. And I believe that, uh, in fact, uh, but I don't think Diana or Alison are here. I believe that Diana and Alison found, um, found this with with um with commitment uh so with other measures that they did find the difference uh so i'm wondering whether uh, it's not strong enough it's the way we looked at it uh, i'm not sure it's really that it's not there to be honest Uh, now, of course, if uh, Johannes or uh, Francesca want to say something to that, uh, th that's that's great too. Hold on. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I can just quickly um, correct that. So I think there was a main effect of strength on at least the blame measure. So if you go to the model results, maybe we can just like. Ah, uh, sorry. Okay, so that's there's not actually bad. that was actually the strongest effect that we found even, um, but there was also an effect of strength um, and denial. There was just no no single effect of denial or device. Um, yeah. So if you're interested in, in what this exactly what the result what of what these our results. <laughs> this was a mixed model where we basically grouped the data by the scenario that we used. So to basically um, um, take into account that the data were grouped according to different scenarios and wanted to sort of control for the content effects of these scenarios. Um, and we didn't, f we found that the trust measure was much less sensitive on the effects that we found in the blame measure which was probably because we always asked for the trust um, as a second measure. So we didn't counterbalance the order in which we asked for these. Um, and so the blame measure was probably more sensitive. Um, but yeah, I think there was a confusion with an earlier version of the analysis where we didn't find the strength measure, which was confusing to us as well, which might've been the, the confusion. Yeah, so sorry, sorry, Johannes, sorry, Mihail, my, my bad. Uh, so Anna Maria uh, Yessa had a question, and I'm wondering if it referred to that slide we just talked about. Uh, 
hold on. Uh, yes, it did. And uh, you all went over it. So thank you very much. There was, a, there was a remark from uh, Cheryl, Shelley. Uh, hi. 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 I, I just wanted to say that we also checked uh, for uh, implicators that were not considered as uh, enrichment, um, even by relevant theorists in uh, Oriel and Peleg, and participants consider them as lies full-fledged lies, we had two experiments, 40% uh, of the times. Uh, and if they uh, did it with the same confidence, uh, with high confidence. So if you would like to look at it as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very helpful. I'm really sorry, but because I have the full screen, I can't see your face, <laughs> but uh, that, that would be great. And, um, and if you can send me the, the, the reference, that would be fantastic actually. Um, I see that Napoleon has a rem remark, but I don't know if that's a question. Uh, I'll, unmute you, I'll unmute you, Napoleon, you could tell me whether I'm right. Okay, yeah, I think this is really interesting. And you know, cooperation is one of these big assumptions, one of these things, big things that need to be in place for communication to work according to how I was nurtured pragmatically from a young child. Uh, and the other big thing that, you know, um, uh, I was always told is, um, and the speaker should be able to um, say the alternative expression, whether it's a quantitative, whether it's quantity, so the more informative statement, um, or whether it's something more concise, something referring to manner. So, you know, there's a couple of big things that need to be in place, cooperation, epistemic state. What would you say, Nausicaa, about cases where the speaker, um, is known not to be able to make a stronger statement. Like as if, you know, in a case where the person you ask doesn't know if all the statements must be answered or not, would you make similar predictions uh, to cooperativity of deriving the implicatures according to the relevant theory model you have here and then unaccepting them? Uh, no, no, I mean, I think if you, if you know, uh, I mean, um uh that basically you you can have you can have an uh, uh an implicature that the speaker doesn't know and i think you can have this implicature uh both uh even more easily in relevant theory uh, but um uh, in a sense uh in Gricean terms as well i mean relevant theory has explicitly an explicit uh, discussion on of that kind of Kind of cases in the um, in the second edition, uh, so I I don't think you would have to unaccept it. On the contrary, you derive the implicature that the speaker is not knowledgeable about that point. Uh, or am I getting you wrong? No, no, it was a simple question, and it, the answer could be just as simple as um, you said. It just um, strikes me that you know we have se several preconditions for implicatures to fly. And, yeah, but one of the precondition is that the speaker has to be knowledgeable. So that's actually one of the preconditions. So to derive a scalar implicature that some but not all, you, one of your stages is really, and, and you have an experiment on this actually with kids. Uh, one of the stages was that the speaker has to be knowledgeable about the state of affairs and the hearer has to assume or to know that the speaker is knowledgeable about the state of affairs. Yeah. And if the speaker uh, doesn't, if the, sorry, the hearer has to know that and if the hearer doesn't know that or can't plausibly assume it, uh, they don't have any reason to um, derive the implicature or they can derive uh, the epistemic implicature that the speaker doesn't know. Can, can I just refer, then, can I just- Okay, I didn't question? get what you were saying, no, sorry. No, okay. I think you did. I just, I'll turn it into a comment. Just to say, I think now that we've got experimental data and, you know, pragmatic theory is also 
quite, I would say, po possibly quite well ahead of the data. I think there's a, a story that needs to be told about how exactly those, presupp those preconditions for communication, so cooperativity, epistemic state, ability, because you could have a second language speaker, for example, who says something that would lead to a manner implicature because it's, it's said in a marked way. But if you factor in the fact that they're a second language speaker and maybe they couldn't have the other way of saying it, then you wouldn't um, derive the manner implicature, for example. I think there's a story to be told about the different and intricate ways in which these assumptions about the speaker um, play into the inferential process, because obviously they're gonna play as you're saying, they're gonna play in, in different ways. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly relevance theory has that. I mean, the abilities and preferences are there. I mean, they're, they're, they're really very much in the theory. So at, at least that, that's there. And I, and I think uh, for, for a Gricean interpretation, um, you, you, well, at least the epistemic part uh, is, has, well, has been put forward for scalar implicatures, uh, I think, since 2004 as, as, a, as, a, as part of the derivation. Now, I think that the example of, you give of, the, of, the, of the, the speaker who's not, not so able is quite interesting. And it's even more interesting because this is the one we give to, uh, to our kid participants. So if it turns out we did something special there, we have to go back and look at all our experiments with kids. So Larry, if you can make it short, we have time for a final question. That's okay. I'm just putting in a couple of references here. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, to Napoleon's last point, the work by uh, Grodner and Sedevi where some of the uh, participants were told that speakers had uh, problems, uh, kind of emotional problems, and uh, the idea is you couldn't really trust them to uh, implicate correctly, and, and the respondents kind of corrected for that, and uh, whether they thought inferences would be, would be, uh, implicatures would be made or not, so that's, that's that point. Okay. Okay, so thank you everyone for the interesting discuss discussion. Thank you, Nausicaa, again for the talk. Um, we just have a short announcement. So the next talk is going to be by Michael Kissin, and he's going to talk about pragmatic strategies and autism. So we're excited about that. And uh, Michael, you, you also get to choose the wine. So you need to send us an email what wine we should drink okay. or buy next time. And when is it, Nicole? It's uh, 14th of January. So it's always going to be uh, mid-month, um, uh, Thursday um, at 8.15 Central European time. Thanks to Nicole and Ira for the organization and to Nausicaa. That was really great. Thank you all for Thank joining us. Everyone, yeah. So hope to see you again in person, maybe next year. <laughs> Make it this year first. <laughs> Bye, everyone.